Hey guys, it's Pastor Craig, and I want to welcome everybody to our campuses today, our Virginia campuses, Pensacola Online. We're so delighted that you're with us. I hope you're inviting friends because empty seats never get changed by the Word of God and the wonderful worship you just experienced. So let's fill this place up, every campus, online. Let's get more people touched by the message of Jesus. I've got a real special treat for you before I get started this morning. We've got a video that we received from our Pastor Noah in Africa. They've taken on their portion of the 100 million souls. I want you to look at this video and be blessed at what you are doing, Upward Church, around the world. Dear Upward family, receive greetings from Africa. I want to take this opportunity to appreciate you for your partnership. From the season that we have been together, we have seen great wonders of the Lord, miracles that have been happening are phenomenal. Seen the power of the Lord as the Lord has been setting free those that have been worshiping the evil spirits. We want to thank God because of what you have done. I want to introduce to you that in Uganda, the fire is going on. We are uh, planning in 2023 uh, to win six million souls. And we are planning to do 12 crusades in uh, the whole region. And in those whole region, we're going to wake uh, the pastors up and also put them in the system where they are going to collaborate together and make sure that they, 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 uh, they are up to winning souls because sometimes they are in fellowships, but they are not united together for the common cause. We want to introduce to them the importance of them coming together to be able to win souls and so that they can celebrate as many souls are coming to Christ. So in those regions, we will be doing those amazing work. Because for example, from the time we have been working and we have introduced this system to them, like in a, for example, in a country of Congo, the people are coming to Jesus Christ in simplicity. All they needed was a tool into their hands, a system of leadership that is intentional about souls. And them themselves, they are seeing a great harvest, which is giving them a great joy. And we are seeing the same happening in Zambia. Now we have gone as far as Marawi. We are in Tanzania. We are in Kenya. We are in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in South Sudan. We are in Mudumbura. Yeah, we are in Rwanda. We are in, uh, in places in Kenya. We are so grateful that the Lord is doing an amazing work now. And those that we have touched are doing, uh, uh, testifying of what the Lord is bringing. Isn't that fantastic? Can we just give the Lord a praise right now, a hand clap right now for all that he is doing through Upward Church? And we're so grateful for Pastor Noah. Did you see all those nations that we're in now? I think we're in a total of about 12 to 13 nations just in Africa alone. And God is moving just this Friday. I spoke to 500 university evangelists and missionaries that we've identified from our 47 university fellowships as missionaries, people called that are going to go into other universities. We are determined to make Uganda a Christian nation. Hallelujah. And you are making that possible. So thank you guys so very much. We've been in this series called Abraham, A Journey of Faith. And if you're here for the first time, it's not too late. You can go back and listen to the first three messages. But what we've done in this series is we have said, if we want to have true faith, faith that God approves of, let's go back to the horse's mouth. Let's go to the father of faith, Abraham, and dissect his faith journey so that we have a faith that is rock solid, that can move mountains, that can see the impossible happen in our world. And I believe God wants all of us to have a legacy of faith that we pass on to our children, that our children would one day say, my father, my mother, 
They were men and women of faith. If God told them to do it, they would do it. And they'll have stories of how you as a parent stepped out and God came through for you. I want everybody to have that legacy because that's my own legacy. My, my forefathers, the two that I know, there are nine of them, but my grandfather and my father, above everything else I would say to describe them, is they were men of faith. They would do and act on whatever God told them to do. And I believe that's the greatest adventure, the greatest purpose and destiny you can have of all the choices out there. The greatest destiny you can have is to be a person that is known for a person that will step out and obey God. So I want to talk to us today about Abraham's faith versus doubting. Abraham's faith versus doubting. Because there's quite a big difference there. And faith lends itself to doubt. The Lord tells you to step out and do something. And what immediately happens? That doubt begins to creep in. Did I really hear from God? Was that dream really from God? Was that word that somebody gave me? Was that just a coincidence. So we want to know the difference between unbelief and doubt. And then we want to know how to conquer doubt as Abraham did. I want you to read with me and we'll go back to this anchor scripture in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And what we're talking about today is that zone between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. And we're asking the question, what do you do between the promise and the fulfillment. Because what you do between those two, oftentimes, most of the time, determines whether or not the fulfillment comes to pass in your life. I wouldn't say all the time, but I would certainly say most of the time. What do you do between the promise and the fulfillment? For Abraham, that was 25 years, 25 years after God said he would have children before he had a child. How do we stand strong? How do we believe God in the midst of that? Well, we're going to look at Matthew 14, and we're going to look at the story of Peter when Peter is called by Jesus to get out of the boat and walk on water to Jesus. It's found here in Matthew 14 because this is going to help us to understand what you have to do between the promise and the fulfillment. Matthew 14, 28 says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. He's doing it. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me, and immediately stretched out, the, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So many times when God calls us out to do something, our eyes are fixed on him, we know we've heard from the Lord, but when we step out, our eyes can start shifting to the circumstances off of the promise and onto our circumstances. I want to say that again. Our focus can move off of the promise, the word, what God said to do, and turn our eyes on the circumstances. And when we do that, if God's called us to do the impossible, what doesn't make sense, it suddenly doesn't seem possible anymore. 
because we've taken our eyes off of the God of the impossible and we've turned him on the waves around us. Things begin to look impossible. And Peter was doing the impossible, was he not? He was walking on water towards Jesus. Jesus said, come. Jesus is right there. He's watching. And I'll tell you, when Jesus tells us to come out of our boat, he is right there, as real as he was with Peter. But if we turn our eyes off of Jesus and we begin to make our circumstances our focus, we too will sink. So the question is, how do you not sink? How do you keep your eyes on Jesus? What do you anchor your hope to? Again, we're looking at Abraham because he's the father of faith. I mean, he, he left everything when he didn't know where he was going. He was 75. He left all security. He left. He, he also receives Isaac after 100, and God says, take him up on the mountain. And Abraham goes, man of faith, father of faith. How did he do it? How did he stay anchored? In Romans chapter 4, it tells us how this happened. Let's, let's look at it together. Romans 4, 18 says, Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never, turn to your neighbor and say never. This is amazing. 25 years, Abraham never wavered in unbelieving God's promise. In faith, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he has promised. Abraham anchored his hope to the promise of God. And if we're not going to sink and give in to doubt and unbelief, We've got to anchor our hope to the promise of God. What Peter needed to do when he stepped out of that boat was when he began to notice the waves, not deny them, not go, well, I'm not really walking on the water. I'm not really sick. No, you don't deny that there are reasons why you can't do what God's asked you to do. It, 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 he's asking you to do something impossible in your own strength. But he, had, he needed to anchor his hope on the promise, what Jesus said to him. And Jesus said, simply, come. You want to walk on the water? Come. Come to me. The water's no problem with me. Come. And that's the only way you and I are going to be able to walk on that water. Now, Simon Peter had moments where he flashed this kind of ability to obey God, even though it didn't make sense. I'm talking about the time Simon Peter was a fisherman. And on one instance, he'd been out all night with no catch. And this is not just, you know, throw your fishing pole over and, and wind it in. This is throwing nets and dragging them in. If you've ever fished with nets, you know this is a lot of work. And so all night long, he throws the net and he drags it in. And they say, we got to have something. We need, this is their livelihood. I don't want to go home and tell the missus that we don't have any food for the kids. Throw the net. All night long, they're working and they caught nothing. And then Jesus comes by. And he says to him, have you caught anything? No, sir, we haven't caught anything. Fished all night. He's a fisherman. He knows when to fish. They're fishing at night because the fish can't see the net at night. Now it's daytime. There's no fish to be found. 
And Jesus says to him, throw the net out one more time. One more time. And Peter answered in Luke chapter 5 and verse 5, and it says, but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. I want you to notice something. He can acknowledge the problem. And you can acknowledge a problem, and it doesn't weaken your faith. Abraham considered his body now dead. It's all right to admit there's a problem. It's all right to say this is impossible but God. Abraham's faith worked because he believed God in spite of the problem. And we're going to see Peter with the same pattern. He's like, Lord, we got a problem here. We fished all night. We toiled all night. We caught nothing. But then he says something that I want us to highlight today. And I pray this will burn in your spirit. For 2023, you will remember this message. You will remember this phrase. He said, nevertheless, at your word. Turn your neighbor and say those words with me. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. We're talking about a haul of fish. How many fish does it take to make a boat start to sink? So many fish that they called their, their friends, their partners, who probably toiled all night too. So I want you to see that Peter's obedience was a blessing to him, but our obedience is going to be a blessing to other people. And other people are blessed when you obey God. And the key was this phrase. And the key to you living this overcoming, faith-rewarding journey, the great adventure, is you've got to make this your mantra. Lord, I don't see how this is going to work, what you're asking me to do. But nevertheless, at your word. Hey, I want you to move here. That's what he said to Abraham. Where am I going, Lord? I'll show you when you get there. And Abraham at 75 years old, he did one of those nevertheless at thy word because it says early the next morning he got up and he left. There were no whys. There were no buts. There were no ifs. It's okay, you said it. I'm going to do it. And this simple act of faith brings miraculous results into Peter's life and all his friends that fished with him, and it brought miraculous results into Abraham's life. This phrase is a key for all of life's situations. I hope, let's say it again to our neighbor. Say it with me. Nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, at thy, thy word. What would happen if we as parents constantly exemplified this to our children? Whatever God says to do, that's enough. When we know we've heard from God, we say, nevertheless, at thy word. Abraham received the word from the Lord, get up and go, and he did it. All those who have understood this principle, hear me, have become richly blessed. They have lived a supernatural life. God never intended the believer, the born-again, blood-bought believer, to live as more, mere mortals live, to function as mere mortals do, out of our reasoning, out of our logic, out of our own ability and our own strength. It's not enough. But God is intended for us to hear the voice of God, the Holy Spirit that now resides in us, to do what others cannot do, to advance his kingdom, 
to cause his purposes, to take gospel domination, to fulfill the dominion mandate first given to, God, to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And the only way we can do that, folks, is by coming into agreement with this phrase, nevertheless, Lord, you say to give this amount, Lord, you know that's stretching our fine lances, but nevertheless, at thy word, I'm going to give to your kingdom. I'm going to obey when you say, help somebody out. I'm going to obey when you say, I know you don't have much time in your schedule, but I need you to go over here. I need you to go see this person. I need you to go pray for them. I need you to go to the nursing home. Nevertheless, Lord, nevertheless at thy word. Noah did this. Think about Noah. He had never seen a raindrop fall from the sky. On dry ground, God tells him, listen, Noah, I want you to build an ark. And I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like because he doesn't have any other boats to go look at. There are no other arks that have ever been built. He doesn't know what he's building, but God says, no problem. You just start building, do it according to what I say, and it'll be the salvation of your family. And Noah works year after year to build this ark by faith because he had had a word from God. And he said, nevertheless, that thy word, he worked untirely, untiringly to proclaim salvation by that ark. He was a preacher of righteousness. And think about this. He, he stood and he preached on that wall and he warned people and he, he said, you know, you've got to get in this ark of safety. A flood's coming. They laughed at him. They scorned him. A preacher of righteousness, faithful. Turn to your neighbor and say faithful. But how many converts did he have? How many people got in that ark? If you know the story, it was only his family. Only his family. But he was faithful. And why were they spared? Because of his attitude. Nevertheless, at thy word. Blessed, listen to me, blessed are all those who will obey God, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult. And I tell you, a dangerous prayer, very dangerous, is when we sincerely pray this prayer and say this, Lord, here am I, send me. Or, Lord, I just want to be used by you. The Lord sometimes will take us into the most trying circumstances of life and train us and galvanize our faith so that we will stand in faith no matter what. Turn to your neighbor one more time and say, no matter what. Even in the face of persecution, we will stand in faith, and many of you watching around the world in these nations that are strongly persecuting Christians, I want to say to you, you've got to get this in your spirit. Nevertheless, Lord, at thy word, because that persecution wants to squash the hope of the gospel in you. But God, but God is faithful, and you will shine like the stars one day if you continue to stay true to the word of God, no matter what, nevertheless, Lord, at thy word. Father, if you're willing, Jesus prayed, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done, Lord, not my will. What was he saying? Nevertheless, at your word, tomorrow morning, I'm going to make my way to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested tonight, and I'm going to go give my life for mankind. 1 Kings 17 tells us, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This is Elijah. Arise, go to Seraphith, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. 
See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, just hold up a minute. A widow in Israel in that time, time frame means there was no family to take care of her. And let me tell you, that's not a banker that God told, her, told Ezekiel, Elijah rather, to go to. In his mind, he's probably thinking, a widow? A widow's going to provide for me? Lord, send me to a, a banker. Send me to a real estate guru. Send me to somebody with means. But God said, go to Seraphath and find this widow because I've commanded her to provide for you. So he arose and went to Seraphath. When he came to the gate of the city, indeed, like God does when you obey him, a widow was there gathering sticks. There she is. I'm telling you, it's so rewarding when you obey God and you watch what he said for you to do to start playing out in front of you. I remember I was taking a team to Tanzania to do a crusade, a missions team, and I was leading them. And I had just met them in the airport in New York. We all gathered there, and I was responsible for them all. So I felt very responsible, right? I'm dragging strangers to Tanzania. And while we're on the airplane, I have a vision of me and the other co-leader that I took with me. And we're leaving the city and we came out into an uh, alleyway and there was a water bar barrel over here and I, all the details of that alley. And there were two foreigners leading us out down that alley and in the vision, somehow I knew they were leading us out of the city. And when I was out of the vision, I said to the co-leader, I said, man, the strangest thing. I said, I'm telling you now so when it happens, you'll know that God has told us to do it. I said, it's the strangest thing. I would never imagine why we would leave the city and leave the rest of the team behind. But this is what the Lord showed me. Well, we were going over there to set up a, a, a video Bible school. So we had all the DVDs. And our plan was, we'll just buy a TV and a VCR there, and we'll set up the school. Well, when we get there, we've been there about a day. We looked around, can't find any shops that sell any kind of TV or VCR equipment. And we come home exhausted from going all over the city. And when we get there, there is a, a young American sitting in the lobby waiting on us. He's a missionary and he's heard we're there and he wants to come meet some other Americans and find out what we're doing in his city. And so we sit down and talk and tell him what we're doing and our problem that we couldn't find a TV or a VCR in the city. And he goes, well, dude, you're not going to find one in this city. You, they can't be bought. We said, well, what do we do? And he said, well, you're going to have to go about 50 miles away and get one. We said, how are we going to get there? He said, man, I'm, I'll come tomorrow and take you. We said, really? He goes, yeah. I was praying for a four-wheel vehicle, and I just received one last week. God answered the prayer. He said, I'd love to take you. Let's put it to work. So the next morning, we go down to meet him in the lobby. He's got another American with him. One of his friends said, hey, I want to go hang out with you guys. So he said, come on. So we're going out the back door of the hotel to the back parking lot, and we step out, we start walking down an alley. Two Americans leading us through the alley, water barrel catching the water, all the details that I described to the co-leader. And I stopped him and said, look, look what we're looking at. And those guys were still walking. I said, this is exactly what God showed me on the airplane. See, when those moments come, when those precious moments come, they're some of the most rewarding moments of life that you will ever experience because you obey God no matter if it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. So Elijah's told, 
go to this city. There's a widow there that I have commanded to take care of you. And don't you know he was feeling it when he walks into the city and there's that widow collecting sticks. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and he said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Now, again, I say this all the time. Our problem is we just keep reading and we pass through the moment and we don't really experience what this feels like because we can quickly re read the end here. But how many know in that moment, it's real easy for Elijah to say, man, this is a widow. I thought she was the one but she doesn't have any provisions. She's about to eat her last meal and die. I must have missed it. I must not have heard from God. Or maybe there's another widow in this town. But Elijah did this. Nevertheless, at thy word, Lord, you told me to come. You said there'd be a widow here. Here she is. And you said, somehow, that widow's going to provide for me. Elijah's got a choice in that moment. You have a choice in that moment. I have a choice in that moment. Are we going to look at the waves? Are we going to stand on the word of the Lord? Abraham was anchored to the promise, and he never wavered in unbelief 25 years. How are we not going to sink? And we've got to be anchored to the promise of God, anchored to the word of God, unmovable, unshakable. And if we'll do that, we can walk on our water. We can see God come through. And that's what Elijah did. And Elijah said to her, don't fear. Listen to this. Do you think he believed God? Could you say this to a widow down to her last meal? Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. The last little bit you have, give it first. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her and her household, listen, not just her and her boy, her whole household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Elijah had a nevertheless moment. You're down to your last meal. Nevertheless, the word of the Lord, I'm telling you, make me bread first. You provide for me and God will provide for you. The widow had a nevertheless moment. She had walked away from there. She went to her house. She could have gone several side streets so Elijah didn't know where she lived and never come back. But she, she had a nevertheless moment too. She had to decide as she's cooking that last meal, it seems crazy. I'm given the last I have, my son's last meal, my last meal. Nevertheless, at your word, Lord. Listen to me. Nevertheless, at thy word is like a trigger on a gun. 
You know, they teach you in safety, gun safety, never put your finger on the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Never do it. Because if you pull that trigger, you're going to get a shot. A bullet's going to fly. Trigger is very important, right? A trigger in God's kingdom that unleashes heaven, unleashes heaven, and will fill your boat full of fish. Hear me. Your life will be glorious. You will have stories to tell your children and your grandchildren how God told you to do something. You did it by faith. People were telling you were crazy, and you did it. I'm feeling this today. You'll be able to tell your grandchildren. Let, let Pappy tell you about this story. Let the chief tell you, little Nina Noel, chief wants to tell you how your, mo- your grandmother and I left our jobs and went to China while they were under martial law. Let me tell you what God did. You'll have stories to tell. That's, I'm convinced that's the greatest legacy you can leave your children, more than wealth, more than houses and lands. Because I would rather be dependent on God's storehouse because his, his, his riches never run out. His treasures never run out. He, in fact, he said, if you leave houses and lands for my sake, you'll re- receive a hundredfold in this life and the life to come. Listen, you plug into that. You get plugged into that. You get that stream open. And again, the currency of heaven, the exchange of heaven is faith. And the trigger for opening up that floodgate of blessing in your life, living the impossible. Nevertheless, at your word. So many crusades, I've done that. They come up in a wheelchair. They come up with crutches. They're blind. They can't see. It looks impossible. But God said, if you'll pray for the sick, I'll heal them. I've sent you out. Lay, pray for the sick. Anoint them with oil. Lay your hands on them. Through technology, we can't do that. So we just say, believe God. We're going to pray a prayer of faith. Nevertheless, at thy word. And then we watch the miracles begin to happen. I want the miracles happening in your life, church. I want to challenge you today. This is a challenging message. Because it's, it's safe on the shore. It's safe to go through 2023 and have everything, all your boxes checked and, you know, all your emergency funds in place. And it's like Helen Keller said, security is a myth. In this life, security is a myth. You can have a diagnosis. You can have a car wreck. Your life can be turned upside down in an instant. That's why we want to be anchored to the word of the Lord. This widow said, nevertheless, at your word. But we must be anchored to the word of God. Hebrews 6 says this. There was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham and Then Abraham, listen, God said it. He did it with an oath by his own name. He said, I'm going to do this. What do you do next? I know what the Lord said do. I'm I'm stepping out. What do I do next? Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Do the last thing God told you to do and wait for the next orders. And if you'll do that and anchor yourself to the Word of God. See, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief just says, I don't believe God can do it. Doubt says, I don't know if He will. Doubt is not sin. We struggle with doubt. We need to extinguish it. We need to know how to fight against it. 
How do you do that? You got to speak to yourself sometimes, like David did in Ziglag. You got to say, why so downcast on my soul? Put your hope in God. City's burnt down. His wife's captured. His kids are gone. His own guys want to stone him and down in the ashes. He's crying and weeping. How's he going to keep going in faith? He had to speak to his soul. He had to say, soul, don't look at the circumstances. Remember who your God is. Why so downcast? Hold my soul. Put your hope in God. You got to speak to yourself. You need to be around other believers to encourage you. The Bible says to speak to one another in psalms and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. You do that together. That helps remove the doubt. I have brothers shore me up. Hey, brother, you stepped out and believe God. Keep trusting. Keep waiting. Like Abraham, you keep waiting. We're standing with you in prayer. You go out that door, you suddenly feel it all burdened on you again. That's part of this journey. It's great to hear him say it, but you're the one walking. It's what you're thinking. But they say, I've been there. I know how it feels. Come on, I'm standing with you. And, get, and eventually, you know what happens? Like a play, the curtains close on that scene and open again. New people, new places, and God's delivered you. Somebody shout amen. So what do you do? You speak to yourself. You remind yourself of the promises of God. God, you said. You get it with other believers. You don't do life alone, and you encourage one another in the Lord. And then you end with this. Nevertheless, at thy word. You remind, you, you, remind, you remind yourself of who you are in Christ. The devil loves to label us and keep us in our past. Doubting Thomas, right? That's how we, we, we've got a label on T Thomas. Doubting Thomas. But God didn't rebuke Thomas for his doubt. He said, here's my hands and my feet. If that's what it's going to take, I'll fill in the blanks for you. But he's still known as Doubting Thomas, even though he became a great apostle of the faith, a martyr for Jesus. Many people know him as Doubting Thomas. What about the leper that was healed? The leper, the leper, the leper. Guess what? The leper was healed. He wasn't a leper anymore. Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. He wasn't blind after Jesus got a hold of him. And the, the devil will try to label you and keep you bound to your past. But you remind yourself who you are in Jesus. You remind yourself how God sees you today. God sees you as an overcomer, a redeemed overcomer that the bowels of hell and hell itself cannot stop you because your faith is in God. Christ, and you are anchored to a hope that Bible says that is both steadfast and sure that enters in the veil behind the curtain where Jesus is gone and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. That's the anchor of Craig Walker's life. It's not just a life insurance policy. It's not something with prudential. It's not in an IRA. The anchor of my life. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And our anchor is not tied to this world. It's tied to the promises of God. It goes beyond the veil. You put your family in that position, dad, mom, grandparent. You put your, your family on that rock. It is a bedrock. It will not be shaken. All the wind will blow. But your house is built on the rock and it's not built on the sand. I want to leave you with this today. How are you going to live your life? Like a scared cat in a room full of rockers? Oh God, what are we going to do now? Oh God, what are we going to do now? Don't know how I'm going to go. Oh God, are you going to rise up? Anchor yourself to the promises of God. They're in that book. You got to read it, but you read it. You'll see those promises. They're to you. You're the heir of Abraham, the father of faith. They're all yours now. You're written in the will. But you're going to have to rise up and say these words. Nevertheless, 
at thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word. God, you haven't failed us yet. You're not going to start failing me now. I'm trusting in you. Let's stand to our feet. I want to ask you, if you would, as you're standing, I want to pray for those that say, Pastor Craig, would you pray for me? I'm in a season of my life right now that I'm in the waiting. How many know God is in the waiting? And I'm in the waiting, and I don't want to waver. I, want to, I, I do not want to waver. I don't want to give in this time to doubt and questioning God. I know there's issues. I acknowledge them, but I know God's bigger because he's promised to never leave me or forsake me. He's promised to be my provider, Jehovah Jireh. And I want to stand strong. I want to pass this test, Pastor Craig. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real high at all of our campuses? Yeah. We go through it, don't we? Because he's building our faith. He's galvanizing our faith in the furnace of the fire. But there's another in the fire today with you. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for those that are trusting you and leaning into you now, Lord. Lean in. Lean in. Boy, I say to you by the word of the Lord, lean into the bosom of Jesus. Let your older brother help you carry the load because his burden is light. He lifts the burden. Hallelujah. So I pray they would lean in and be courageous and bold. I pray that they would keep their hand and their finger on the trigger of nevertheless at thy word in Jesus' name. While heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, if you need to get your life right with Jesus today, and you say, Pastor Craig, I need to go back to the cross today, maybe for the first time. You say, I want to be on that anchor, Pastor Craig. I want to know God like that. I don't want to be blown around by life and worried and anxious and and just caught up in this world that changes by the moment. I want an anchor in my life. I tell you, Jesus can be that anchor, but it first takes that trip to the cross where you say, Jesus, I'm all in. Maybe you've done that before and you've fallen away. Listen, today is a day of salvation. The Holy Spirit is dealing right now. You're in these campuses. You're online, not by accident. God's speaking. This message was for you, and you know it. And he's saying now, I need you to take a step towards me. I need you to repent. I need you to acknowledge your sin. And if you'll do that, I'll run to you, and I'll help you today. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real high? Thank you for these hands that are going up in our campuses. Online, let us know in the chat. I'm taking my step to Jesus today. I'm running to the cross. Now, church, help me pray for these. Let's pray out loud. Mean these words from your heart. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins. I stand in need of you. I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. And I'm sorry. From this day on, Lord, I receive your grace right now. Thank you for paying my penalty. And Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Teach me how to live every day. And I will obey in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand when you do that. Praise God. Praise God for the best decision you'll ever make. I thank God for you that are going through it or will be going through it. I believe this message is going to bolster your faith. And you will be known as a person who says, nevertheless, at thy word. Let's give it up to the Lord as our campus pastors are coming to tell you about some next steps and some announcements that we have for you today.